Hello, good people of South Yarra Community Baptist Church. Uh, it's really a, a, a privilege and a pleasure for me to be with you um, this evening. Um, as, as Nathan said, I'm on the Central Coast. Um, I'm on dark and young country. Uh, I happen to do and be a lot of things that start with the letter P. I'm, I'm a parent to, to Noah, Leo and Emery, a partner to my wife, Sam, pastor to this beautiful little alternative community of misfits, a podcaster, just because I've got to keep the P's rolling, um, and, and a poet is kind of what I see as my uh, centre of gravity and kind of the thing that I feel like I have to offer the world at, at my best. Um, I occasionally preach, um, but I, I am more of a poet than a preacher. So I'm going to open and close this message uh, with a poem at each end in case everything in between that is thoroughly forgettable. Um, the poems might be um, slightly more memorable. So I recently um, put together a, a book called Poems for When the World is Ending because it feels like over the last three or four years the world has ended time and time again, you know, sort of living through repeat apocalypses. Um, so this poem is called The Cost of Living. And it kind of ties into some of what we're going to talk about tonight. It is not just the price of petrol at the pump, lettuce worth its weight or increasing interest rates. It is the breath and blood of labour, the heave and stretch of hard-earned arrival, the midnight breastfeeds, the midday existential crises, the gritted teeth moments, the minutia of Mondays, the bruised knees and broken bones of learning limits, testing pavements, midnight hospital visits, uncertain breaths. It is asthma, anaphylaxis, arrhythmia, arthritis. It is the toil of offering one's heart in full bloom and knowing it may be returned, wilted and wasted. It is the ever ticking meat of seeing a heart through the winding urban streets of existence. It is the rent increase your body issues your mind for all those anxious flatmates running riot through your bloodstream. The intergenerational debt of your flavour of inherited trauma. All the billable hours you deserve to charge for listening graciously to your unceasing inner dialogue. It is cutting the losses of every relationship you've ever invested in without seeing any growth on the return. All this the price of admission, the cost of living. So I wrote that poem um, partly because the cost of living has been a substantial theme in recent years, but uh, I kind of got thinking about how the phrase, the cost of living is a bit of a strange phrase. On the one hand, we immediately understand uh, what it means and that life is expensive and that the price of everything feels like it's constantly kind of going up. On the other hand, it's strange to measure life economically. Um, and if you were to think about life on the whole, what's a life worth? What does a life, what kind of would you pay for a life? Um, it feels like the category doesn't quite match to talk about life in these economic terms. Um, perhaps that's even more the case if we were to swap the word uh, life for love. What's the cost of loving? Um, and again, that sentence makes sense on one level. We know that love um, can feel expensive. But on the other hand, we know that love also breaks out of the categories of economics. Tonight, we're going to explore a kind of similarly strange phrase that the Apostle Paul used uh, when he said, let the only debt you owe anyone be love. Uh, we'll come back to that um, in a moment. So I was in Melbourne recently in your place of, of living and um, came down recently to record a live episode of the Spiritual Misfits podcast um, that has kind of emerged out of our little faith community here on the Central Coast. And we pulled together a panel of beautiful people from a, a mixture of uh, different denominational backgrounds to discuss the question, is Christianity still good news? Uh, it was a really fascinating conversation and um, you can check it out on the podcast if you're interested. Um, but I think that question is probably worth having in the background ahead of the passage of scripture that we're going to reflect on a little bit this evening. Is Christianity still good news? Um, the fact that you're you're engaged here on the Zoom, that you've rocked up, you know, maybe you you probably think the answer is yes. 
Um, but I don't think it's that controversial to suggest that many people have experienced and continue to experience forms of Christianity that are emphatically not good news. And we think about what kind of news Christianity has been for um, for First Nations people or for um, queer folks or for um, all kinds of people who have been pushed to the edges. Um, and in fact, our church basically started to be a place for those that had experienced Christianity largely as bad news. Um, so maybe a better question is, what kind of Christianity is still good news? And what makes the difference between the kind of Christianity that people may have a, a bad taste in their mouth from and the kind that is life-giving and, and, and beautiful? So we're going to be dwelling on the reading from the lectionary found in Romans uh, chapter 13, um, verses 8 to 14. Now, I didn't grow up with the lectionary, and I have to say that this is, this is the most liturgical experience I've had in a long time, and um, I'm feeling very blessed by it. What a beautiful artwork that liturgy was, and probably the best use of Zoom that I have seen. Very impressive, uh, you know, flicking around with all of the different voices and, and just wonderful. Um, I didn't grow up with the lectionary, though. The kind of Baptist church that I grew up in uh, was much, um, much more anti, uh, if, if anything, it felt it was anti kind of ritual and, and liturgy and uh, viewed those things with a heavy dose of suspicion. But in recent years, I've been quite drawn to the liturgical, particularly in the context of a, a small faith community that is fairly post-evangelical while trying to find connection with the best parts of a longer tradition. You know, what is the good news that has lasted um, since, since Christianity first arrived on the scene? And so uh, we've actually used uh, the liturgical resources on the Laughing Bird website that's kind of come out of your community a few times, and are really grateful for all the work that's been put into that. Um, it's fantastic. Having said all of that, as a guest preacher, the lectionary is a bit of a lucky dip experience. And um, when I went to look at the readings for today, I was a little bit concerned to discover that some of the options were, uh, you know, the plague that involved the death of the firstborn sons in Egypt. I find that a uh, little bit challenging. Um, the psalm that, you know, talks about God putting swords in the hands of the people so they can kind of bring justice to the nations and execute God's sentence. I can imagine that being used in some uh, somewhat unpleasant ways in the wrong hands. Um, then we have the gospel reading where Jesus essentially gives some conflict management advice, um, which might be good advice, but as far as, you know, kind of ex exciting me as, you know, uh, a preacher, I was a bit unsure about that. So I was sort of feeling like, geez, the lucky dip on, on this week on the lectionaries is kind of feeling like I'm drawing some short straws here. And I will say that there are interesting sermons that could be preached on, on each of those passages of Scripture. We could talk about violence and politics and conflict and how we understand our role in the story and where the Scriptures might be a mirror into God's heart and where they may be uh, a window into God's heart and where they may be a mirror into parts of our hearts that crave um, empire and violence. And, you know, lots of interesting things we could discuss. But when I read the passage from Romans... I felt like I had hit the goal in the lucky dip uh, and I felt like I was reminded about the good news of Christianity as well as being a diagnosis for why Christianity has often failed to be the good news. So let's just reread a little bit of that part of Romans. Um, Nathan uh, assured me that I could use whatever translation I wanted, but I really liked uh, the kind of laughing bird uh, version of this part of um of the text from Romans. So the first couple verses uh, in Romans 13 uh, from verse 8 it says, Keep yourselves out of debt. Let the only thing you owe anyone be love. If you are loving others, you are measuring up to the standard that God's law has always been seeking. The law contains lots of detailed commandments, such as don't betray your marriage partner, don't kill anybody, don't pinch other people's stuff. And don't get preoccupied with the desire to possess things you don't have. All such commandments can be summarized into the one simple instruction. Love your neighbor as attentively as you love yourself. Love never does the wrong thing by anybody. So if you really love, you will measure up to the whole law without even thinking about it. Now, I like uh, the Apostle Paul and uh, a lot of what he wrote. 
But whether or not he intended to, he definitely wrote a bunch of stuff that has led to some ongoing frustrations, shall we say, within the life of the church. Feels like to me, many of the largest debates that Christians of various ilk continue to have come down to interpreting things Paul said. Is Paul egalitarian or complementarian? Did he have some sort of penal substitutionary atonement in his mind or not uh, when he wrote about the cross? Uh, was Paul against same-sex relationships? Was he homophobic? Was he pro-slaves? You know, most debates about Christian doctrine seem to emerge more from things that Paul said than things that Jesus said. But in this section of the book of Romans, Paul is undeniably, unmistakably, unyieldingly singing from the greatest hits of his, his rabbi. Paul uh, imitates one of the greatest moves that Jesus makes in the Gospels when he's asked about the greatest commandment in the law. Uh, Paul, like Jesus, reminds his audience that the law must always be understood through love and not the other way around. Love is the summation of the law, not the other way around. The law must always conform to love, not the other way around. Um, you know, this morning, uh, our little community, we got to go out um, on country with um, some beautiful Aboriginal friends of ours. And it's really interesting. They're not, they wouldn't identify as Christians, but they were just talking to us about First Nations spirituality. And they talked about the, the law, L-O-R-E, um, as opposed to the law, L-A-W. And in First Nations culture, the law, L-O-R-E, is, is a big thing. It's um, but Rob, my friend, he said, you know, the LAW, the law often in Western society is about staying out of trouble. What do I need to do to stay out of trouble? He said that law in First Nations culture is about reciprocity. It's about giving because you've received. And I wonder if that's a better way to think about the law that Paul is talking about, that the scriptures give us, that the law is, is built on the foundation of love. It's about a cycle of giving and receiving rather than just what do I need to do to stay out of trouble. Is it possible that the majority of the time when Christianity becomes bad news, love is being interpreted through some sort of legalistic LAW law rather than the other way around? Is it possible that what is meant to be central, love, has often been moved to the edges and what maybe was supposed to be at the edges has often become central? You know, I was thinking about it, it sometimes a, a passage like this almost seems too obvious, you know, to preach a sermon on. You know, we know, in a sense, love. Yeah, that's that's kind of it. But if you think about it, it seems kind of wild to me. But I want to suggest that it feels like in much Christianity, love at times feels like an optional extra. And I think this can be true for people on the political left and the political right. You know, no one is immune from elevating whatever law means to us above love. You know, we may have different interpretations of how to understand law. Whether we identify as more conservative or progressive, I think many of us, if we're honest, we have a strong sense of what we perceive to be the right approach in many situations and the right kind of Christianity. And I've got plenty of strong convictions and I'm not saying that those don't matter or that they aren't worth our time and our energy and our, our scrutiny to arrive at. But imagine if every single interaction you had during the next week of your life was characterized by asking, what do I owe this person? Be they in your household, in your neighborhood, on your social media feed, someone you walk past, uh, what if every single person you interacted with this week, you asked, what do I owe this person? And the answer that you lived out was love. Um, now, I don't believe that love uh, tolerates or excuses injustice. I'm not talking about a kind of love that is merely uh, just, you know, gentleness and politeness. Um, I think love can look very fierce. Um, and I also you know, I'm not talking about uh, putting ourselves in situations um, that put, put us in, in danger. You know, I think there's been an increasing realisation in recent years that loving ourselves as we love others might mean that we have strong boundaries, particularly if someone has been uh, abusive or harmful. Love might look like keeping our distance from that person. So I'm not trying to say it's a one size fits all blanket rule, but if we were to generally ask 
of every person that we interact with. What do I owe this person? You know, and, and to think what might the answer look like if it was love? I wonder if that would make a difference. Um, you know, I do think that if what we owe to each human being, uh, if each person bears the divine image and what we owe is love, um, then we must always approach others with dignity, with respect, with a posture that seeks what is best for the other person, even if we find them deeply frustrating, <laughs> even if we want um, to have nothing to do with them. You know, what does love look like at this basic level? You know, respect, redignifying people, um, trying to see them as more than their ideology, which, which can be challenging at times. The word O, oh, I find particularly interesting in Paul's statement. And this comes back to this kind of cost of living idea. You know, what does it mean to owe only love? You know, when we talk about owing, uh, it's normally a measurable amount. Um, and it's part of this realm of kind of equal exchange. You know, what do I owe um, has a lot to do with, you know, evening out a sort of ledger. But Paul is implying that love is perpetually owed. You never satisfy a debt of love and you aren't doing it to pay anything off. You're doing it because it's the whole point. Um, love is what is beneath the law. Love is what is the fabric of creation. Love is the whole point. That's why it's not something to pay off and be done with because there'd be, there'd be nothing left on the other side of that. Love's the whole point. Owing is legal language and it's also finite language you can't have an eternal debt you can't eternally owe a debt um, because a debt has to be finite otherwise it's it's illogical but paul is reminding us that um that love which is unconditional which is eternal which is without end this is the only thing that we can owe each other eternally um, it's in a different realm than a measurable, finite economic exchange, which is where we live so much of our lives, constantly kind of in economic mindsets when love actually goes beyond that and is the continuously uh, generative force, um, the creative force that is, that is God, that is the ground of all being. And the greatest model we have of this kind of, of approach to love um, is, is Jesus. You know, what does God owe humanity? Um, does God owe God's creation anything? Um, well, of course not. The answer, you know, to what God owes humanity is nothing. Uh, we could say that if we're here, if we have breath in our lungs, if we exist, we have been shown a grace. It's not something that we earned or paid for. Um, and yet, what does God show humanity? Uh, unending, unconditional love it's not because that's what god owes but it's what god continuously shows and i believe what we're invited to participate in there's a phrase that um, gets used a bit in the counseling world that i have really appreciated some of my counseling friends telling me about in recent years and it's unconditional positive regard the idea is that whatever a client brings into the counseling space whatever they're working through you know a good counselor um, shows unconditional positive regard to the person, which doesn't necessarily mean that they endorse or approve of all of the actions or behaviours of the client. Um, and yet the aim is to always create a sense that they always want the best for the client and they respond in every situation. The ideal is to respond with unconditional positive regard. I think that's a beautiful concept which I think God shows us, unconditional positive regard. I think that is exactly what it means to owe no debt but love, to show people unconditional positive regard. Uh, imagine if we asked of each interaction, what do I owe this person? Only love. I want to say that a Christianity that looks like that is good news. And I have experienced people that seem to live out a Christianity that looks like that, and you can feel it, you can taste it. Um, but when Christianity becomes divorced from owing only love, when Christianity feels like it owes the world judgment, or owes the world moralism, or owes, you know, whatever version of self-righteousness, 
it pretty quickly can become bad news. So my invitation and my challenge to you this week, wherever you find yourself, is, is to ask before you meet with someone, before you write a message to someone, before you come home to someone, uh, before you walk into the office to someone, maybe try asking, what do I owe this person? And let your answer be only love. That might be really challenging. And again, do that with wisdom. Do that understanding that there's nuance. But that's a question that I want to ask more. What do I owe this person? What would it look like if I said only love? Um, that can be really difficult. So I'm going to finish with another poem that's kind of a reminder to myself and to us that uh, even when we don't do that, uh, it's important that we continue to be, I guess, kind and compassionate and loving towards ourselves. Um, this is called The Path is Never Straight, and it's reflecting on times when my Christianity was probably a lot more characterised by law and judgement um, than by love. I can still feel my fingers at the keys tapping out eternal warnings to fellow 13-year-old pilgrims on the OG messenger platforms, brains early in development, didn't stop my confident assertions. I came at matters of belief like a child soldier, lobbing theological grenades in the name of love. Thankfully, the turnings and conversions birthed from the faces and spaces that flipped my assumptions and judgments came divinely appointed again and again and again. The ones the world calls lesser, whom Jesus calls blessed, kept bringing me home to the news that God never wanted appeasement or child soldiers or fear-based ultimatums, just mercy and love and embrace. Though I shudder at times to think of my youthful arrogance, I know this current me in progress Fingers at the keys, tapping out reflections will appear immature in my rearview mirror 20 years from now. And even as I look at my own children in development, I never want them to feel ashamed of the winding path they must walk to come home to the news that God only ever looks like mercy and love and embrace. So my friends, may you... Oh, only love. And through the grace of God, may that be the way that, that you and I um, enter the week before us.